Well, thank you, and, and it's a joy to see a crowd here tonight. Uh, I do want to thank the uh, Historical Society for inviting me, in part because it caused me to think a little bit differently about my love and interest in the Salish Sea. Um, I, I, I think mostly in the future about what's coming and what we can do, especially in the whole area of protecting the resources. But it's also been really interesting to me to look back and see what I can learn about history. Like the first thing I can know is that there is a history already for the Salish Sea name and its application. Next year will be the 10 year anniversary of the official naming by the Coast Salish people and the Canadian government and the US government. And so there's a history there. I can tell you that it's a name that's going to stick. Uh, one never knows at first. I always thought, because I'll explain later, that if I was really lucky that maybe the Salish Sea in reference to it would be a footnote on some kind of scientific paper. I could say there's, there's many different kinds of people that have dedicated energy to the Salish Sea not only in literature, but also in song and dance and in economic efforts. <laughs> I saw this, this little um, statistic the other day that eBay has over 70 products that are Salish Sea related. <laughs> I don't know what quite to make of that, but my favorite though is that there is a company in Bellingham called Salish Sea Midwifery. It's a midwife coming. And it, you sort of chuckle at first, but the person who runs that wrote an essay one time about the appropriateness of uh, having a midwifery uh, company um, be a champion of the Salish Sea. Both sort of the same kind of problems, uh, embryonic, uh, uncertain future, uh, and um, the hope that comes with something that you care about. So there are lots of ways in which I'm sure if you think about a little bit that uh, the Salish Sea comes up a lot. All right, now I'll tell you a little bit. I'm not, I went through school and I grew up without PowerPoint uh, education. <laughs> so I'm a beginner and I have a granddaughter that's helped me a lot, but bear with me because I hope it's full of good spirit and things like this. Two of the major iconic uh, Im images of the Salish Sea, in my mind at least. And iconic is something that, that I challenge everybody to think about. What are the, your iconic images, your iconic uh, messages that relate to the Salish Sea? And whether you can be a better steward of this place and the things in it that uh, are the icons. Okay, so let's start first with uh, a picture of the Salish Sea and get oriented. This is a, a, a map that's done by Stefan Freeland at Western Washington University. And I worked with him and I said, Stefan, I wanna have a map that doesn't have uh, any cities on it, doesn't have the international border. And I said, and I don't wanna have names. And that was too much for him. <laughs> he said, I've gotta put some names on. So you can see, there, the, some of the names in the major parts of the Salish Sea. But I realized that maybe it's good to take a little bit of time to orient yourself to this image because you'll be seeing it a number of other times tonight. So where are we? Bellingham Bay, right? And then the Strait of Georgia, the San Juan Islands that are all familiar to, her, to us. Whidbey Island, Whidbey Island's big, isn't it? We'll come back and talk about that. And then up the Strait of Georgia. How about Vancouver? This is the lower mainland. The, the, you can see by this color, this is all the uh, floodplain land of the Fraser River and the city uh, on uh, the north uh, west edge of it. And then going up the Georgia Strait, 
uh, for me at least, this is home. This is where I spent my summers as a kid, uh, up in the northern part of the, uh, the Georgia Strait. And then the end up here. Now maybe it's good to spend a minute talking about the end. Any of you that have had the uh, privilege of going up the inside passage will know this part of the Salish Sea. This is where the big body of water reduces itself to rapidly growing streams in one place or another. The most famous is Seymour Narrows, which goes up into the northern part of Johnston Strait. But there are other passages there too that also uh, have very rapid uh, tidal currents uh, that if you've gone through them, you'll never forget them. Anyway, that's the northern boundary. The southern boundary of the, of, uh, the Salish Sea is down around Olympia. It's, I always love to look at this because it's reminiscent of what happened when the last glacier left the Salish Sea Basin some 12,000, 13,000 years ago. And it drained, all this was an ice mass, drained down through the, uh, the lower part of um, the Olympi area and out through what is now Grays Harbor. We'll talk a little bit uh, later about the, the name confusion of Puget Sound. But let's take this right now as Puget Sound. Then finally, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, starting out here at the ocean and coming in to the beginning edges of uh, the, the San Juan Islands and then Admiralty Inlet that takes you down into uh, Puget Sound. Okay, I have a question for everybody. There's this thing that I found with my friends, not snobbishness, but a very distinct uh, preference. Uh, and usually it comes down to, do you prefer sockeye salmon over Chinook salmon or you do prefer Chinook salmon over sockeye salmon? Okay. Everybody got their answer? How about hands up for Chinook? You have to tell us the price first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. How about sockeye? Good answer. <laughs> Not because it doesn't cost as much, but it's healthier for you, and it has the most interesting of life cycles of uh, any of the salmon. And uh, we're going to come and have a look at that in the moment. But let's first get a little sense of what's going to happen tonight. This is the title that you saw. Uh, got to talk about the Salish Sea is a new name. What does that mean? And talk about it as an area because it refers to more than just the sea, as it turns out. And then why did it have, why, did, why, why did we get a name? Why, what is this thing about applying the name? to the Silly Sea. Okay, so those are sort of the three themes that are run through, and I'll try to break it up into a series of stories. And what I want to do first is talk about sockeye salmon. And the reason is, if you look at the Silly Sea, this definition, it's easy, right? Strait of Georgia, Strait of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, wherever those boundaries are, that's what we have for the Silly Sea. However, I've noticed over time that there is another use of Salish Sea, and that is to refer to the watersheds around the Salish Sea. There's almost eight million people that live in the watersheds. That's where most of the problems come from, and uh, it's only appropriate when you're thinking about Salish Sea as a kind of environmental issue that you also consider the watersheds that go around that. And so on the map, if you look carefully, you can see the watershed lines at the top of the, of the mountains. It's not very clear, is it? But it goes up all the way around that there is this uh, boundary for the watershed. Now, if you're astute and think about it and know a little bit about the Salish Sea, the fact especially that the Fraser River is the single largest river that comes into the Salish Sea and dominates in the effect on the ecology. So, um, the whole of the Fraser River watershed is in fact part of the Salish Sea when you look at it in this way. Here's a map that uh, Stephen Freeland again at Western did and it's just a, it's a, uh, not a finished uh, product. He hasn't completed it yet, but it does give you a good view of the Fraser River watershed. All of this area, way up into Canada, over to the east, 
down almost to the border and uh, ending, well, at Hope. Hope, if you've been to BC, that's sort of as I consider the uh, start of the inland. It's a huge area, probably as big almost as the state of Washington. It has fortunately not very many people living in it and it has had a lot of effort on the part of the Canadian federal government to clean up the uh, industry effects have been there in the past and it does not have a dam. And BC has to be rewarded and constantly reminded that the resources of the city C are far too valuable for uh, putting a, a dam to make electricity out of. Okay, let's get introduced to this little story we're gonna talk about sockeye salmon. This is uh, one of, well, let's start with the Fraser River because that's where the sockeye first start, the ones I'm gonna talk about tonight at least. There are other sockeye runs on the North Pacific that are larger. We've all heard of Bristol Bay and the number of sockeye that come back there exceeds what happens in the Fraser, but it's still a very major sockeye river. Uh, and this is just to give you a little sense of how amazing it is. When the, uh, well, sockeye, when you talk about rivers, you're talking about um, rivers where they can spawn, rivers where they can travel, and ocean where they can feed. And uh, the red line here is the path that the sockeye take after they've left uh, the, the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, or sometimes after they've gone up the inside passage and spilled out in the ocean uh, at the north end of Vancouver Island. About 3,000 miles that these fish are moving pretty much constantly through the three years that they spend in uh, the ocean. Uh, and um, during that time, they're feeding mostly on small plankton. Uh, so if you know about Chinook, they eat bigger fish like herring and other uh, uh, what we call forage fish. Sockeye, the, reds, the red flesh comes from the little copepods and other kinds of plankton that they are feeding on as they travel through the ocean. Uh, and the thing that is amazing though, somewhere along here, as they come out, they got to make a decision at some point to get back to the mouth of the Fraser River in the third week of August. That's just when they got to be back there. And so somewhere out in the ocean here, something goes on in their bodies that says it's time to go home. And this is the mysterious part about sake. We really don't know what they use to navigate with when they're out in the ocean. When they get up in the fresh water, we can uh, understand that pretty well. But this 3,000 mile journey that gets them back to the mouth of the uh, Sealy Sea, third week, or the, to the mouth of the Fraser River, actually, the third week of August. Uh, once they get to the mouth of the Fraser River, the interesting thing is that they stop feeding. No more feeding as soon as they uh, taste the fresh water that comes up. The, or comes out of the Fraser River. So up the Fraser River they go. Here's the Fraser River coming in out of Vancouver, and it comes up to Round Hope, then it goes up what's called the Fraser Canyon, which is a must go to see, and then splits. And this is the uh, Thompson River that goes up to around here. And right about here is Adams River, uh, which is a river that has a lake associated with it, and uh, a nice spawning ground right at the mouth of the river, the kinds of things that sockeye need. So let's go and have a look at what these look like. The sockeye that come up uh, the Fraser River come up sometimes by the millions when they are on the spawning grounds, uh, oftentimes uh, look like this. Uh, Sue, my wife and I, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, were at the Adams River because this is one of the particularly large runs, which I'll say more about in a moment, and that uh, uh, we didn't see quite this, but we saw thousands, thousands of bright red sockeye salmon with these emerald green uh, heads. And actually, this is one of my favorite. <laughs> this is what they look like when they're on the spawning ground, just about ready to end their lives. Uh, the males become really very protective, get these big jaws and teeth, to uh, chase off other males. 
The female, of course, is the one that digs the red or the nest, and the male watches while she lays the eggs and guards the eggs while she fills the back in with gravel, which, well, we'll talk about equality at some point. <laughs> anyway, that's the way sockeye do it. They spawn just once, and then they die. So that four-year cycle uh, is, is ended at the spawning grounds. When the eggs hatch in April, March or April, they come out and they spend a year in the lake, which is another thing that is very unique about sockeye, that they have this freshwater phase. And then the second year, they meander down the, Fraser, the Thompson and Fraser rivers again and out into the ocean. Now, I want to tell you a story about numbers, which really defies uh, understanding and belief. These are numbers of sockeye that have come back to the Fraser River with information that goes back to 1901, but 117 years ago. That's the first time we've really had good estimates of how many fish come up. 1901, 40 million sockeye approached the Fraser River. Not all of them went to the Adams River, but a goodly number of them did. Uh, and, and then I've skipped what happened in uh, 1902, 1903, 1904, the numbers were much lower, but 1905, 33 million came back. And four years later, 28 million. And then in 1913, uh, 39 million. In 1913, uh, a railway company was building a rail um, passage down the Fraser Canyon. And right at the place that we now call Hell's Gate, they put in dynamite, blew up, uh, the, the rocks and <laughs> caused the whole side of the mountain to slip into the river uh, and provided a blockage to passage that almost killed all of the fish. Very few of them got past. You can see 1917, four years later, eight million made it up and four years later, three million. So in, during that time period, all the way through to 1982 about, the runs were just up and down. There was a lot of effort put into restoration. Hell's Gate is a very fascinating place to go to see the, the, uh, the message or the, the frequency of fish ladders and how they've all uh, developed a passage for these fish to get through. But even though those things happening, there wasn't much going on in this time period, 1913 to 1982. Runs were sporadic. There was a little bit of maybe support that they were coming back, but then, uh, in 2009, the, the run just completely collapsed. Less than a million fish came back, and uh, fisheries managers were predicting that the run was going to extinction. Uh, and then in 2010, 29 million came back, <laughs> which absolutely confounded everybody. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to sort of be in the area in 2010, and the thing that probably tells more than anything is that there wasn't a single brand new pickup truck for sale anywhere along the coastline of the Sealy Sea. <laughs> the fishermen had made lots of money that year. And then, uh, so there was a wonderment, what's gonna happen? Four years later, 2014, 21 million come back. And then this year, a little fewer, it was a somewhat less than 20 million, but around that. Okay, so what, what can you notice about these years? If you're really wise, you could say, okay, I'm gonna take 2014, and I'm gonna back, back up in four-year increments and see where it ends up. You back up in four-year increments, and you end up in 1913 and down to 1901. There is something about the Sakai uh, population that is cued in to this four-year uh, cycle, the big numbers come back. And the really good thing about it, scientists have no idea about why. And it just gives me great pleasure to know that there's something like this that's happening that we haven't figured out yet. And I don't know about the time in the past uh, with indigenous people, whether they were aware of um, the, this four-year cycle. I suspect they had to be for sure, but uh, I haven't seen any evidence for that. Need to take that to the elders. Okay, so you can see here, the Sealy Sea has this bit. Uh, it's a place where the young 
as sockeye come as they come out of the river uh, and provides a nursery ground for them to feed so they can get the energy to go out in the ocean, provides a place when they come back to find their way to the mouth of the Fraser River. And I should mention maybe some, this is something that a lot of people know about uh, uh, the salmon in general, is that they smell their way back as they approach the Fraser River, of identifying the Fraser River, and as they come up the Fraser River, to uh, ignore any other kind of odors that comes up until they get to the one that is home for them, which is another, I think, amazing, amazing thing. So the sockeye salmon is something, we just had this experience a couple of weeks ago, so it's fresh in my mind, but it is also a, a measure of the importance and role of the Salish Sea in one of these species that is hooked up to the ocean on one side and the freshwater systems of land on the other. So now what I want to do is talk about the history of the current names that we're so used to. Uh, Puget Sound, Strait of Juan de Fuca, Georgia Strait. We all accept those as a given and figure out they must go back a long way in the past. Uh, and first thing, got to give homage to Harvey Manning. Did that resonate with anybody? He's been dead for quite a long time, but uh, he was uh, one of the original people that was looking for a name that could uh, be applied to a large area of the uh, of what's now the Salish Sea. And the the first thing is that the that, that we Harvey, as much as anything, uh, made it clear that there was no single name in the indigenous cultures to cover the area that we're, not calling, or that we're now calling the Salish Sea. Didn't have a name. Harvey Manning found the name Wulge for uh, a large area of the Puget Sound and uh, pr promoted that for some time, but realized that there were limits to that. Unfortunately, uh, he died before the sort of resurgence of naming the Salish Sea came along uh, and uh, never got to talk to him. But uh, let's go. Next, then, and look at the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Okay, so it starts here out in the ocean and comes up, skirts around the uh, edges of the San Juan Islands, comes down Whidbey Island, and then out the uh, coast of the Olympic Peninsula. Okay, pretty easy, isn't it? That's, a, that's what we call it, the uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca, and must have been somebody named Juan de Fuca at some time who have figured it out. Juan de Fuca, born in 1536. And uh, actually, the first thing to note is that he wasn't Spanish. He was Greek. So he was bo born in the Greek island of Kefalonia, which at that time was part of uh, Venice's control over what, that, that region. So he was really close to the Spaniards. Uh, he liked boats. He was a pilot. He started to work when he was in his 30s, perhaps, for the Spanish on the west coast of the Spanish holdings. So this is uh, southern Mexico on the west coast. Uh, I don't know, no evidence about how he got there, but he was operating one of these ships. Uh, the, the, wasn't the captain, he was called the pilot, but he had a, a particularly important role in navigating because almost everything was just uh, dead reckoning at that time. So anyway, he would pilot the Spanish ship full of gold and silver, silver over to Asia trade the gold and silver for all the goodies that uh, China had at that time, and then he would take those back to Spain. And that went on for quite a number of years until 1571, some British trader snuck in. There was no, no warfare at the time, no pirating, but a British trader snuck in and sunk Juan de Fuca's boat and cast them ashore around Cabo San Lucas, uh, saying, good luck, guys. So he and the rest of the crew, uh, uh, Juan de Fuca and the rest of the crew, made their way back. They built a little boat and made their way back down to where the Spanish uh, settlements were. And he built another boat and started to explore up the coast. And the thing that is most interesting is that in 1592, still we're 
in the 16th century, right, in 1592, he claimed that he found the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Not only that, but any of you look back into history, he said it was the Straits of Anian, which is um, the language that was used at the time for the Northwest Passage. So he claimed that he saw the North, had found the Northwest Passage. And he made his way back to Europe, took uh, a few years, wanting to try to get uh, support for an expedition to go and find uh, the Northwest Passage. He was not successful. There were the political problems going on between Britain and Spain, France, they were all fighting sort of, and he could not find anybody that would sponsor him. So he went back to his uh, home island in Catalonia and died soon afterwards. However, his efforts in Europe during that time started a legend, a legend that a Northwest Passage existed and he had the latitude that that passage uh, was to be found at. And uh, that, that legend kicked around for over 200 years, never losing its uh, excitement until uh, when the sea otter traders started to move in along the coast of, uh, of uh, North America, what's now North America, um, there was, there's one uh, a merchant, Barclay, who uh, came down the coast of Vancouver Island, poked his nose into the Puget Sound and said, or Puget, in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and said, this is Juan de Fuca Strait. And so he named it in uh, 1787 about. So that time period, over 200 years, that name floated around Europe and uh, it was, gave the promise of finding the Inside Passage. Barclay didn't go in very far. There weren't any sea otters in the Strait of Juan de Fuca which was uh, the case then and still is the case uh, for the most part. So he went off somewhere else and uh, left that name, though, in the records in Europe. So that's the story of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Juan de Fuca probably never got all the way down to the end, was able to create this legend and uh, at least got named for it because Barclay remembered that legend. Okay, so what happened when... Vancouver came into the Salish Sea in 1792. He mostly just came right down the Strait of Juan de Fuca. In fact, he was not particularly con in, uh, convinced that it ever existed uh, and was a little hesitant to use it, but he at least didn't name it anything else. So Vancouver, he was, he was charged for two things. First, to um, claim possession of all lands that he stood foot, set foot on in his voyage uh, through uh, looking for the, for the Inside Passage. And the other thing he was uh, charged to do was find out whether there was the Inside Passage. Follow the shoreline, keeping it on your right, never leaving a space that could be a passage off back to the east. So Vancouver came in following the, the uh, shoreline on his right, came to Admiralty Inlet, came down into Admiralty Inlet and anchored here at Possession Point, which is the point at which he said, I claim everything for King George. He at that time said, and I'm going to name all these waters, except for the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the Gulf of Georgia. So in 1793, the Gulf of Georgia had all what we now know as the Strait of, uh, Strait of Georgia, as well as all of Puget Sound. So Puget Sound, when I'll, we'll get back to it in a moment, didn't even have any standing at first. It was just a little bay at the end of uh, his passage. Okay, so that, that was in 1792. Let's see if I can remember now. That lasted until 1865. So 75 years or so, it was the Gulf of, uh, of, Gulf, Gulf of Georgia. And in 1865, though, uh, by that time, the boundary had been set, the national boundary had been mostly set, hadn't gone through the San Juan Islands yet, and America now said it didn't like the idea of these waters being called the Gulf of Georgia. So they defined Georgia Strait as uh, over to Migby, Migley Point on, um, on Lummi Island, and everything to the north was then the Strait of Georgia, and then we had the whole area down the south, 
which didn't really have a name yet. Okay, we all know Puget Sound, right? So let's, let's look and see just where Puget Sound is. So Vancouver didn't want to take the vote all the way down, so he said, Peter Puget, go off and find the, whether or not there is a passage that goes through to uh, Europe. And he did, and went down and uh, scoped it all out, convinced that there was no passage that could get out, came back to Vancouver and said, the deed is done. There is no Northwest Passage here. Uh, and Vancouver said, okay, I'll name something after you. So he named Puget Sound. The boundary, though, that Vancouver put on Puget Sound was Tacoma Narrows. So when Puget Sound was named by Vancouver, it only included all these waters way down at the end. A pretty skimpy reward for Peter Puget, but that's all he got. But maybe in the long run he won, because as, uh, as development occurred and people came down from Canada and, and up from the Columbia River, there was a need to push the boundary of Puget Sound north. I call it Puget Sound creep. So uh, the federal government, the official namer of names, said Admiralty Inlet. We'll put the mouth of Puget Sound there. That makes sense. It's a, it's a really entrance to the rest of Puget Sound, and uh, it sits well with mariners. But it didn't really sit well with people in Olympia who wanted to have Puget Sound to go further north because it left this area up here, which is Bellingham and Blaine and the San Juan Islands, in, not in Puget Sound, they were in Georgia Strait, and they were in a, a, a named part of the sea that was part of another country, and Puget Sound did not like that. The people of Puget Sound from Olympia. So they first came up with this idea, let's have northern Puget Sound, and that's where I came in to the story, about 1988, I remember being at a, uh, a meeting in Mount Vernon about coming of oils, uh, and uh, this people got up and talked about, well, well this is Northern Puget Sound, and <laughs> a tugboat captain got up at the end and said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been on these waters for over 20 years, and I've never heard of Northern Puget Sound. So there was some confusion. And those of us that live up in this area, at least for me, still have resentment about this Puget Sound creep north. But the, the story gets even worse. In the late 1900s, 1980s, late, maybe up close to 19, uh, 1990, the legislature of the state of Washington decreed by state law that all of the inland waters of the state of Washington shall be called Puget Sound crazy. So here's the boundary of Puget Sound now. Come across with the, uh, the international boundary and then comes down to the middle of uh, uh, Juan de Fuca and goes right out the middle. This is, the line's not particularly accurate but it gives you that sense. So now uh, the federal government and charts do not recognize that use of Puget Sound. State can't uh, put names on uh, federal charts, but it is a name that causes, in my mind, great confusion when you try to say, are we the Strait of Juan de Fuga? What are the environmental problems there? And what is this thing called Puget Sound that's going there? So anyway, it's one of the things we have to live with. I don't think, maybe if everybody writes a lever, letter, we can convince Inslee to change it, but that's a whole other story. Okay. Um, that's then the, the history of the names. Nothing really simple about it. And there's nothing to say that things won't change in the future. You know, when Vancouver went through Vancouver Island, he named it after himself. But he was also pretty uh, cognizant of the Spanish that were in the area at the same time doing their own exploring. So he said, let's have a shared name for this big island, Vancouver Quadra. So it's named technically Vancouver Quadra Island. And I don't know when that changed along the way, but at some point, uh, Quadra got left off, and uh, that's what we have now for, uh, for the name of that island. Okay. Now, here's one uh, shout out that I'd like to make. There's this book, the story of, this, of uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, I got mostly from this book. 
uh, Juan de Fuca Strait. Barry Gao, who is a Canadian, but a very good historian of uh, maritime matters. It's a good book, worth reading. And uh, if you can get it on it, 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 get a hold of a copy, it's well worth your time. Explains not only the whole street of Juan de Fuca story, but many others, and well, read it if you can get a chance. All right, let's go on and, and justify the Silly Sea name, uh, why it uh, comes about, or why I think we needed to have a name. And I, I discovered it through science. I was part of a group of people in the mid-1980s that was working under a grant from NOAA to figure out the value of uh, the marine resources in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and up through the islands because Alaska oil was coming and the federal government was a little bit concerned about potential impacts and not being prepared. And it was a fascinating time and um, there was an oceanographer there named Curtis uh, Evansmeyer who said, this is how the circulation works. You know, there's a big estuary circulation here that uh, is driven by the fresh water and we should all know about it. And that's where I learned about it and uh, came to the conclusion that not only is the Salish Sea an ecosystem, which means all the parts work together in some way or another to produce a system that can be described as a single system, uh, which is something that for resource managers is particularly uh, interesting. And then not only that, but the ecosystem of the Salish Sea is an estuarine ecosystem. It means the waters are influenced by fresh water to some extent. So here we have an estuarine ecosystem that takes up almost all of what we're coming now to learn the Salish Sea. And why is, it, why is it important? Why want to know about that? Well, there are a number of things about estuaries. We all know, if not clearly in our minds, estuaries are important ecological systems. Think Chesapeake Bay, think San Francisco Bay, and uh, Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia, now the Salish Sea, is that they are very valuable as, ecos as environments for what we call biological productivity for growing plankton, growing uh, food for plankton, growing small fish, growing big fish, uh, feeding birds, feeding mammals, and uh, all the, the things that go along with high biological productivity. And so it was, it was clear that this ecosystem, that's an estuarine ecosystem, has this kind of high biological productivity and is valuable that say in the bottom there, it has resources of economic value that all of the eight million of us in one way or another find useful. Okay, so what's a driver? Fresh water. Where's our fresh water from? 50% of the fresh water comes in the whole Salish Sea comes from the Fraser River. Uh, and uh, the bulk of the other uh, water comes from the rivers coming in to uh, mostly Puget Sound, but a little bit further north as well. What's interesting, as you can see, is that, that the, the major peak of the water from the Fraser River is in June, in the start of summer. The major peak from our local rivers is now, fall and uh, spring. I don't know if anyone was watching, but a week ago, uh, the um, I looked one day at the flow of the Nooksack River. It was down to 400 cubic feet per second, which is just about gone dry. Four days later, it was 20,000 cubic feet per second. Three big rainstorms, and we were into flood conditions. Uh, that's the kind of thing that happens in these rivers. And that water, as it goes into the ocean, has an effect. And this is going to be a little challenging because it's hard to understand the nature of the, the relationship between the rivers and the ocean. But we'll give it a try. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Most of the Fraser River in midsummer, the Fraser chocolate brown water floating at the surface, pushing up against the higher salinity marine waters 
at the edge. And yet, you know, sorry the slide is not very good, but you can recognize maybe BC ferries about to approach Acta Pass. Where's the brown water? It's only 10 miles away. It's gone by then. In some way or another, it's mixed in. And it's that mixing that is the challenge. And I guess if you could summarize all of what, how the Sea estuary works, it's all on this little slide. Uh, what are the kinds of things that we can recognize? Okay, we have river water coming in from, say, where the river is right there, and moving across the surface is lighter, right? Fresh water is lighter than salt water, so it stays up at the surface. But as it moves across the surface, being pushed by this hydraulic head of the river, then the, down below, there's a layer of friction between the fresh water and the salt water that pulls the salt water up towards the surface. And so as all this stuff goes towards the mouth of the estuary, it gets saltier and saltier and saltier, but not totally salt. Uh, it, it still has a little bit of fresh water in it. Out of the, the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, the ocean is 33 or 34 parts per thousand, which means 3.4% salt. And uh, the water coming out of the Strait of Juan de Fuca is 30.1 maybe, just a little bit less. Okay, uh, and so uh, what happens as the fresh water drags the salt water out there's a vacuum that's created in a way that pulls deep water from off of the mouth of the estuary, pulls it into the estuary up until it starts to meet the uh, edge of the river. Okay, um, that's the kind of basic mechanism that creates the, um, the circulation, the estuarine circulation. And you want to get a little more technical about it, you can wrap, try to wrap your mind around this one. Okay, we have a river, river coming in at the mouth of the river, coming out across the surface, floating because it's less and less, but all the time pulling up deep salt water from below, and it's getting saltier and saltier as it goes along. And what's so interesting about this estuary is that if you measure, say, there's a thousand gallons of fresh water coming in at this point, down here, where it's starting to mix with the salt water, it's over 10,000 gallons. It's a, a tenfold increase, at least. In fact, in the, uh, in the Sealy Sea, it's probably more than that. Okay, so try to wrap your mind around that. And if you have the thought saying, what about the tides? Because if we think about the movement of the surface water, we always, tides are what you see, right? And the tide goes out and it comes back in, and if you're in the Strait of uh, Harrow Strait or, St or Rosario Strait, it's moving. Okay, so this, this pictorial shows that what happens as the surface water of the estuary moves out towards the ocean, the, the tide moves it from here to here. And then when the tide changes, it comes back almost to that. There's just a little tiny net movement towards the ocean. So tides are what we know, but they're not the driver for the circulation of this estuary. The tides are important though, because when you get tides like in Rosario Straits going over rocks, it's like a river. It just creates this turbulence and you get mixing at that point from a uh, surface of the of whatever projection there is coming from the bottom up to the surface of the water. The tides have an effect, it's what we know, but they are a minor component in moving this estuarine circulation along. What is, how, what is the impact of this, uh, of this um, estuarine circulation? Okay, you can see here the first, second sentence, the volume of the Sealy Sea is replaced definitely more than once a year probably twice a year. And imagine that if you can. The total volume of the Sealy Sea moves out to the ocean and is replaced with new mixture of fresh water and salt water. It's something that I really can't, you know, in my own mind, uh, imagine or come to accept. But all the studies that are done by the scientists indicate that that is the case. And why is that important then? 
if you have a long residence time, we call what residence time? How far, how long does the water stay in one place? Um, as it gets older, stays in one place for a long period of time, it starts to pick up contaminants, starts to lose oxygen, it loses the uh, nitrogen that stimulates the biological productivity. And you can see then that this kind of movement that we have that replaces the water is fundamentally important for maintaining clean water quality and high uh, biological productivity. Okay, so if you, if you could keep that, it's really good. This is not something that I find very easy to really understand myself or to, uh, uh, to be able to show and talk to other people, especially when we're trying to do it in just a few minutes. I want to give another uh, uh, line of credit here to Curtis Evansmeyer. He was the one that I learned this from. He was part of that, uh, that uh, study back in the 80s and where he said, clear, water goes out at the surface, comes in the deep, we have an estuary circulation. And he sort of left it at that. Then he went on to other things after he retired. And probably he's best known for the rubber ducky study. <laughs> he's an oceanographer interested in ocean uh, ocean uh, currents, and he um, found out that there were over 28,000 rubber duckies that were disp disp uh, set into the ocean right about this point here. And he said, okay, let's find out what happens to these things. They float, they don't uh, disintegrate, they're good markers. So this happened in 1992, and uh, he has been following it all the way up to 2007, and these rubber duckies went a lot of different places. Ended up in Africa, in uh, Australia, in Indonesia, and up into the Arctic, made it through the Arctic and over into the Atlantic. It's just amazing to me that uh, this kind of current goes on. But the evidence is clear, and uh, I can't remember how many they, in the study, they, uh, they were able to recover, but uh, it was a sizable number. Okay, were there any of these rubber duckies that made it into the Salish Sea? No, none were found. Now, what do we know about estuarine circulation that can solve that, answer that question? The surface water is always going out. Yeah, so. Uh, there's another kind of puzzle that we have in the Salish Sea that is um, measured by markers, and that's the uh, foot in boots uh, things that maybe you've heard about. <laughs> so, yeah, since uh, 2007 to, actually it goes now to 2018, there have been over 17 uh, mostly uh, tennis shoes found with feet in them still. Well. Sounds a little gross, doesn't it? All right, so the question then comes at, well, where are they coming from? Did they come in from the ocean? No, because the circulation is going out. Yeah, so they, it made it as far as Port Renfrew out here, but all these others in Puget Sound and up in the Strait of Georgia, and uh, not the Strait of Juan de Fuca, are all floating along and I'm sure it's not the last one that will be found. Okay, so that's, that's why I wanted to see a name for the Salish Sea. Not because of the shoes, but because <laughs> <laughs> there is this thing called the estuarine ecosystem. And this, this estuarine ecosystem is important for biological work and biological productivity uh, in uh, the Salish Sea. And it's something that needs to be uh, understood and followed and protected. And if you don't have a name for something, you can't ever know it. So that was my reason. There are other reasons. I mean, everybody in this room maybe has their own particular reason for thinking that the Salish Sea name is a good idea. And there are lots of reasons for that. And we could talk about that. But I'll leave you with the, uh, the one that uh, made most... Uh, most interesting to me. Okay, is the Salish Sea healthy? Not healthy enough. And there's a lot I could do. Well, we've got 
if you look down this list, there are a lot of the species that are very, very much reduced in number compared with uh, natural, natural values in the past. And there's a lot of reasons why. I think all you have to do is look at this chart, which is an identification of all the wastewater discharges in the Salish Sea. I mean, you can't be very optimistic when you say that and say, are we really treating each one of those discharges so it's not having an impact? We're not, particularly in Puget Sound, where a mix of stuff that comes out of the toilet doesn't get picked up by the sewage treatment plants, goes out into Puget Sound, and I think Puget Sound is always going to be challenged because of the huge population density around a small amount of water. Okay, a quick though, everybody's interested about southern uh, orca whales. Population has gone up and down, been influenced, but it's all definitely in a down movement at this point. Uh, there are some areas of the Salish Sea that are particularly important to uh, the southern orca, uh, southern resident orcas. This area between the San Juan Islands and the southern Gulf Islands around Harrow Strait is a favored one for feeding. And if there's anything that we can do to help the uh, orcas, it will be to protect this area, protect it from the no noise that comes from shipping that we're learning more and more has a negative impact on their ability to communicate with each other and to uh, catch food. And then as the also, it's cleaner water than the Southern Puget Sound where biomagnification of toxins is a problem. And uh, if you've probably seen something like this somewhere, that uh, it's, you can start off with toxins. In this case, they're talking about PCBs in low concentration in waters close to a, a discharge. But by the time it goes through the food web, it gets to the point where accumulation of toxin becomes a problem. And I've heard that the southern orcas are mostly um, hazard waste disposal site objects. If they die, that's where they need to go, which is kind of sad for sure. Okay, so um, it's in our minds now. I wanted to mention it. Uh, personally, I'm not particularly optimistic about the outlook with the, fa the challenges that they're facing, but the state of Washington is pledged to do something, and our governor said they, he will not let the southern orcas go to extinction. Good luck. Okay. How do the name get on official maps? So here's, here's sort of the timeline. The name came to me in about 1988 uh, when Puget Sound was creeping north more and more and more and I realized that there was this ecosystem. I said, there's this thing there. It needs to have a name. So I suggested to the Washington State Board of Geographic Names that this whole total body of water be named the Salish Sea. They gulped and did a little bit of analysis and said, no, it's way too experimental. It doesn't really have support. There's no kind of uh, group that are using it. Uh, we're not going to approve it at this time. But they did the really good thing of tabling the idea. Instead of saying no, if they said no, we're not going to do it, then you can't come back. But if it's tabled, you can bring a, a uh, 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 an application back. So it took 20 years and uh, there was interest again in the name Salish Sea. It started to pop up. So I thought, okay, I'll take it seriously and did the application through both the uh, Washington State Board of Geographic Names and the equal equivalent in British Columbia. Did a survey and uh, got considerable support it was a good, um, a good thing to do that name. And I realized at that time, um, because between 1988 and 2008, things had changed quite a bit, uh, that uh, First Nations and uh, tribal interest in natural resources was being recognized. And I knew that without some support from First Nations and tribes, this idea was not going to go anywhere. So there's this group called the Coast Salish Gathering that speaks really for all of the Salish groups, uh, tribes and, and First Nations in the Salish Sea. 
And I went to them and they said, we like the idea, we'll take care of it. You get it through, <laughs> through the uh, bureaucracies of BC and Washington, we'll take care of the tribes and First Nations. And they did. And then they even did it faster. And in 2007, they proclaimed to the world, but it didn't really get in the press, that this is the area that was their Salish Sea and that they were going to protect it. And it took another two or three years for everybody else to fall in line and give it that kind of, uh, kind of protection. Who gets to name something? Anybody can, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I live up uh, on Bellingham Bay in what's now called Locust Beach. That name wasn't there 10 years ago, and it's got a widespread following. It's not official, but it's something that's useful for people, and the extent to which a name is useful is the extent to which it will be used and remembered. So King George, he made a big press for sure in 1790 when he sent Vancouver uh, and then the U.S. Board of Geographic Names and Canada, B.C., uh, Geographical uh, Office, all had a play in evaluating and saying, okay, the name is okay, we'll use it. And as I said earlier when it started, the name is being used. Lots and lots of ways. Okay, a little personal thing of why I am particularly interested in the Salie Sea. I already acknowledge that I have more salt in my blood than most people, and I also love fishing. And this is a picture taken when I was three years old. My parents, fishing in Georgia Strait up by Jervis Inlet, went out for an hour before breakfast and came back with these beautiful fish. I think of this, and I think of them, and I think of the way things were. This is my baseline. This is the way the Salie Sea should be no, everybody's got their own baseline that's influenced by the conditions that you have when you live in it. This is mine. I expect more of the Salish Sea than there is now. Will we fight, see this again? Hard to say. I don't know. But I am hopeful. And I got another reason, actually. My great-grandson, who's now 14 months old, he's going to be a fifth-generation Chinook fisher, if I have anything to do about it. All right, thank you. You've all been really good in listening, and I've appreciated it.